It has never been easy to come forward after a sexual assault. But when it involves an A-list comedy star, reporting it and standing firm, even amidst a media onslaught and multiple court cases, requires an uncommon kind of bravery. That becomes clear in the breathtaking story chronicled in Andrea Constant's memoir. It's called The Moment. Standing up to Bill Cosby, speaking up for women, and Andrea Constant joins us now. Hi. Hi. It's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So you grew up uh, in Toronto, well around Toronto, right? I did. Yeah. I, uh, as a youngster, I pretty much grew up in every corner of the city, but Toronto proper, I am born and raised Toronto girl. And basketball, we kind of have something in common, which is basketball. Yeah. Um, I kind of stopped growing at around age 12. <laughs> <laughs> but basketball uh, was uh, played a huge role in your life growing up. Yes, it did. Um, I was, an, I was always like an, a, an athlete when I was younger, but I really didn't start playing basketball until I was around maybe 11 or 12 years old where I started playing like locally in leagues. Um, but I really didn't start to take basketball seriously until I was probably in my second or third year in high school where I had to make a decision on what sport I would play because I played so many sports as a youngster. So basketball felt like a natural fit for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I started focusing in, really, really honing my skills when I was in my maybe third or fourth year in high school. And my goal was to really try to get a basketball scholarship. I ended up at the University of Arizona. Um, Your I grandparents lived there, right? Yes, yeah. I chose the University of Arizona. I went to visit maybe four, four or five schools. Mm -hmm. And I chose Arizona, which out of all the schools was the furthest one from home. And I think my parents were kind of shocked, you know, uh, like, OK, out of all the places you could go, you're literally going so far away that we're probably hardly going to see you. But why Arizona then? Was it the grandparent factor? You know, it was multiple things. Mm -hmm. They had a brand new coach. You know, they didn't have a winning record at the time, which wasn't the most important thing for me, mm -hmm. but they had a great coach in Joan Bombancini. She came from Long Beach State, so she had a great reputation, and they were just starting. And I really just felt like, you know, I'm okay with just starting off on a team and seeing where we ended up. I didn't have to go to an established program. So how did you end up meeting Mr. Cosby? I ended up meeting Mr. Cosby later on in my career after I had played professional basketball in Europe. So part of my dream as a basketball player was to try to get to the highest level, which at the time, it wasn't the WNBA. The highest level at the time was just to go overseas. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. And so I played a couple of years overseas and I came back. I started working in a sports marketing com company, Nike. I worked right in the area, again, in downtown Toronto. Mm -hmm. And then a friend of mine um, told me that uh, Don Staley was looking for a uh, director of operations for Temple University. And so it was. And she was the coach at Temple. And right? she was the coach at the time. And it wasn't really until, you know, early on in my working career that I actually ended up at Temple and then subsequently met Bill Cosby a year later after after arriving. Um, you write in the book that he seemed generally interested in your life and in your family. Uh, what was it like to have a famous icon in your life? You know, I, I talk about this in the book. I didn't grow up watching the Cosby show. I didn't, I knew about F Fat Albert, but I didn't grow up watching these shows. So his celebrity and his status as, you know, a black icon, mm -hmm. um, it, it was kind of over my head, but w once I arrived at Temple, I knew he was an important person. Obviously, when I came to kind of be around the program and learned that he supported the program, he was a trustee there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I sensed his importance when I arrived in Philadelphia. Um, and it was very genuine and authentic when I first met him, and he seemed very caring. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, in the beginning, he seemed like he cared. You know, he, he wanted to help. He kind of inserted him, his, him himself into my life to try to support me and mentor me. But looking back, I have a whole new understanding of what that friendship was about. What was it about when you look back? It was about grooming. Mm -hmm. Your friendship with him, um, over 18 months, I think it was. Yeah. 
He uh, bought you sweaters. He would. Uh, he was somebody that you can confide to about your mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm. You described him as being kind of a grandfather figure. Mm -hmm. um, he would even make uh, comments about, you know, uh, that I think he bought you a hair dryer at one point, or he said you needed to uh, blow, your, blow hair your hair out, out straight. Blow your hair out straight. Um, and you would have dinner, you would have phone calls. Mm -hmm. um, and then on January 6, 2004, all of that changed. What happened that night? So I do discuss it in the book. and. I, I think, you know, from where I am now in my life, it isn't a, a night that I'd like to revisit a whole lot. My, it's, it's so public. I mean, somebody could Google my name, somebody could pick up the book and actually see what happened that night. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about the details of actually what transpired in those eight hours. I think I lay them out really well in the book. Um, but what I can say is this, I walked into that evening, you know, Andrea, young, innocent Andrea, and when I got in my car at five o'clock in the morning, I was a different person. And I think without revealing the details of what happened, everybody knows that it was a sexual assault. Um, but I can tell you that I experienced shame like many survivors do, like many victims do. I was shocked. I was embarrassed. Um, I was ashamed, again, shame. And I wasn't, didn't have the strength in the moment. I did not have the strength, because some people will say, well, why did you not go to the police? Why did you not go to the hospital? I think, you know, it was what happened to me that night really silenced me and took my voice away. And your family, um, you come from a very close family. In the yes. book, you write about how you became more withdrawn. Um, mm -hmm. You weren't spending time with your nieces. Your mom noticed a shift in you. You would wake mm -hmm. up um, in the middle of the night um, from nightmares. Mm -hmm. You describe this one scene in the book of having this dream mm -hmm. where you're kind of drowning and then you try to reach out to the ship or the boat, but then it's just barnacles and you just kind of sink back into the water. Um, and it takes you about uh, a year to tell your mom uh, mm -hmm. what had happened. What did you go through in that year? I think, you know, I mean, I think I had all the shame and embarrassment. I think it was something that turned into a pattern of behavior. And for me, it was, I wasn't myself. You know, I was very trusting, very open, um, you know, easy to do things like, you know, jump up and play with my nieces. And I just wasn't the same person. Um, everything changed. I was withdrawn. My appetite wasn't the same. I was not able to focus on my studies at that time. I was becoming a registered massage therapist. And so I was distracted. I was constantly thinking about what can I do? What can I say? And I think I sat in that silence until I had that dream. And that dream told me, if you don't say something now, then you will be going down a road that is very dangerous and you, you could drown, you could die. And I understand that now. It was like my subconscious sending me a warning saying, you might be addicted to drugs, you might get addicted to alcohol, you might start harming yourself, um, you might go down a negative pathway. And so for me, it was like in that moment I fought for my life and I said, I have to tell somebody. I have to tell somebody. And I told my mom. And that set off a chain of events uh, mm -hmm. from your mom, your mother calling Cosby and confronting him uh, to your brother-in-law, who is a police officer, making sure the authorities were not notified of what happened. Mm -hmm. um, as the person in the center of it all, what was that experience like? Oh, it was like being in, it was like being in, um, it was like being in a whirlwind. I think I was, you know, personally, like feelings, like I was really stressed. Um, I didn't know what I had started. So it was like telling my mom the secret. It was like, well, what have I started now? I've started a ball rolling. 
and it, it really was. It was it 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 upset my whole family. We had stress every day. We had to deal with the media. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my life, I had to um, speak to lawyers and what that was like. It was just a whole new awareness, almost like being in a danger zone. It was like I'm I'm in a danger zone. So it was, you know, I w I was you know, very nervous every day. My family was nervous for me. Um, so it was, it was nerve wracking, you know, to, to say the least, it was very difficult. The Montgomery County District Attorney said the case wasn't strong enough to proceed with criminal mm -hmm. charges against Bill Cosby. Why was the case not strong enough in their eyes? Uh, the case was not strong enough in their eyes because I had waited a year to report so I did not report right away. So they saw the, my delay in reporting as something that would work against me. Mm. Um, I believe they thought that I was inconsistent at the time, which I can tell you is very common for, for survivors to have inconsistencies in their story. I think that's just the way trauma works. Mm -hmm. And so I think those two things combined, it might have been other things that I can't really think about right now, but those two things combined, um, you know, in that, you know, I think that we, both Mr. Cosby and I at the time had been seen in, in a bad light for, for whatever that meant to the current district attorney, that there was, um, you know, um, X marks the spot for certain things about um, our friendship that just wouldn't have hashed out in a court, in a court of law. But, but I think um, those inconsistencies and, like I said, those... Those things are very common. So it was unfortunate at the time that he decided to, to proceed and not bring charges. Um, but, but, but I understood. I just was disappointed because well, I, really, I really did feel um, I came forward. Um, I didn't sue him civilly. Mm -hmm. I tried to put him in jail back then. And it was kind of like a, it felt, probably felt like a punishment because, you know, you were being penalized for taking a year to... Because I can only imagine how terrifying it's Bill Cosby. Yeah. Right? Um, you ended up suing him in a civil case, and you write in the book. Um, in November 2006, we settled the civil case successfully, and Cosby's lawyers offered us vastly more money than the 150000 we had asked for. Mm -hmm. That settlement provided a kind of satisfaction, a certain validation. And it meant that I would have the means to pay for therapy and any other help I needed to get on with my life. But it didn't erase that hollow sensation I'd felt that bleak February afternoon when I'd heard that there would be no criminal charges, because it wasn't money I was after. What were you after? I was after justice. <laughs> I was after justice. I um, didn't want to see him um, do this to anybody else. Um, I, I, what I didn't really know was that there was already a prior history. And in fact, I might have been one of the last women that he did that to. Um, but for me, it was just about righting a wrong in whatever sh shape or form that took. I just, once you get on the train, once you get on the justice train, you just have to stay on the train until you see where it gets off. And my commitment to myself was just to work with my lawyers, to stay on path to justice. And although I did get justice, it was a hollow sense of justice. Mm -hmm. Money just doesn't make things go away. And everything um, kind of shifted uh, in October of 2014. A clip of a stand-up comedian mm -hmm. by the name of Hannibal Buress went viral. Uh, let's have a listen. As the f smuggest <laughs> old black man public persona that I hate. <laughs> this kid's on TV. Pull your pants up, black people. I was on TV in the 80s. <laughs> I can talk down to you because I had a successful sitcom. <laughs> yeah, it was great women, Bill Cosby, so <laughs> kind of brings you down a couple notches. <laughs> I don't curse on stage. But yeah, you're a rapist, so. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, I, can't, I can't even imagine what's going on in your head, because I know you've heard that clip many times. But as we're watching it, he's saying that he's a rapist and people are laughing. Right. What did that clip unleash? Well, I think for many pe for different people, it unleashed different things. Um, but for me personally, it was like an earthquake when, when I saw that come across my Facebook. Um, I came across that and listened to that clip just before I was going to bed one night. 
And I remember thinking, like, this is all just a part of the past. Nobody's going to Google Bill Cosby and rape, because if they do, they're going to see my name. And so it was like, that's the earthquake right there of I've lived in relative peace and quiet going on with my life for all these years. And now it's opening up again. And I thought to myself, you know what? I don't think this is going to get anywhere. Although it's kind of like he's saying some very big things here. And when I woke up in the morning, it was just gone viral. And I started to think that maybe it's some things are going to come to light. And I had to be prepared for that. I had to be prepared for anything. And in the book, too, you ask this question I'm going to ask you. Um, why did it take a viral clip to bring him down when so many women mm -hmm. had come forward back in 2005 yeah. um, to say that they, too, had been attacked by Cosby? So, you know, I think, I think people paid attention because it was a fellow comedian and he was a black fellow comedian. I think that had some sway with how the public, how this kind of like started unraveling in the public. Um, so, so I think that was a very big component. I think the other thing was that, you know, Hannibal Buress was a very young comedian at the time. He was up and coming. And here was Bill Cosby, who was about to play a grandfatherly figure on a new NBC sitcom. And he had a few other projects in the works. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, and I, I might not know exactly what it's all about, but I think there was a little bit of air in what Hannibal Burris said in terms of, like, look at what this guy's done. Like, pay attention. Like, don't you guys know, like, this is a guy who's raped women. And so I think for him, it was like, you know, like, there's other people out here and you're giving this guy an opportunity and look at his past, look at his history. Like, here we are, there's other comedians, we would love a job on NBC or Netflix or, you know, so I think there was a part of him that was just sick of, you know, like listening to a man who had berated his own culture, you know, berated young black men, telling them to pick up their pants. Um, so I think there was some, some level of like, the hypocrisy, maybe? Yes, exactly. Uh, when the second trial went ahead, it was at the height of the hashtag MeToo movement. Mm -hmm. uh, about 60 women came forward to say that Cosby had also attacked them. Mm -hmm. What was it like to be swept up in such a huge uh, movement? We have a picture there for all the women. Yeah, it was, um, you know, I could kind of feel something, you know, like I, I could feel the momentum building. Like, I didn't know it would just start with, um, you know, one woman who happened to just kind of say, like, hey, if it's happened to you, hashtag me too. But I, I could just feel the momentum. And for me, that was a wave that I rode. That, mm -hmm. that movement, the Me Too movement, was the wind beneath my wings. And I knew that whatever this movement was, it was going to bring about great healing because that was a very big part of my journey. That's why I wanted justice. I, I wanted healing. I wanted closure. I was going to ride that train all the way to the end. And so, you know, it was just a movement that I just rode. I was very happy. I was very, it was painful and happy at the same time because coming forward to say something inappropriate happened to you is very painful, but it's the only way to really step forward and to start your healing process. And so I just thought, wow, this is a brave movement. This is a courageous movement. And for me, I really think it changed the consciousness and the awareness, mm -hmm. you know, of the jurors, for example, coming into the second trial, who were much more aware and much more conscious that, that it is, that a lot of people have been sexually assaulted. A lot of people 
are coming forward, a lot of people. And so I, I, I think that they were more aware. They seemed more aware. I don't know about the jury questioning, mm. but I certainly felt that that new consciousness and new awareness that the, the Me Too movement brought was present in the courtroom. Um, he was found guilty and the sentence was a minimum of three years. Um, after uh, there was a surprise meeting in a small room at the courthouse, uh, some jurors were there. Um, they told you, they gave you hugs, those um, emotions were exchanged. Uh, were those jurors' words enough to help you rebuild your life? Because they say that they believed you. They yeah, believed it, was, you. it was really just a very, um, it was just a moment that was so important for me to hear, and I'm so glad that they did say that. It was really emotional. Mm -hmm. I think there was only a couple of times I really cried during the trial, and that was a moment where I burst into that room and I was in tears. Mm -hmm. I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that from people who made that decision. Of course, a lot of my supporters and a lot of people in my family and people say, you know, I believe you, I, you know, but to hear it from them, them it was, it was different, and, and it wasn't like I went into that trial trying to convince anybody. It was just about telling the truth. And I feel like by hearing those words that they heard my truth. There was one more bombshell in the case. Uh, in June of last year, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court overturned his conviction. Um, when you heard what happened, how do you respond? Well, I was very disappointed. Why did they overturn it? Um, I was very disappointed um, for the message that it would send to other people in terms of coming forward and saying, you know, th you know, if something inappropriate has happened to them, for for how survivors report sexual assault. I didn't want it to 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 be a reason why somebody wouldn't want to come forward because they would say, well, look at Andrea, you know, Andrea got justice in her case, but then he turned around and he got out of jail two and a half years later. Um, so for that reason, I think, I think it sent us, you know, the, it was disappointing. But I think ultimately uh, that decision, it wasn't based on the incident that happened that night. It wasn't based on sexual assault or anything like that. It was based simply on a deal that was done with a district attorney where he apparently gave Cosby immunity and said, if you sit for a deposition, then we're never gonna bring charges against you. And he did not memorialize that in writing. And I think knowing that it was about that and not necessarily what happened to me, it didn't change um, my, my position, my strength in terms of um, being, you know, surviving that night. But it was, you know, it was, you know, it, it gave me a reason to turn around and to fight and to advocate for people and start changing laws, start defining consent in the law. What is consent? What does it mean? What does it, what doesn't it mean? Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, also to, th that shouldn't have been possible. And I think district attorneys should get a judge to sign off on an immunity agreement. And I do hope those laws change. Mm -hmm. Obviously, being here in Canada, there are things I can't necessarily fight for but I can use my voice and I can speak up and say, yeah, I wouldn't want that to happen again. We only have a few minutes and I guess I gotta sneak in this um, question because I thought it was so, uh, some of the things you wrote and they were so powerful. You write that you don't wish uh, Cosby, you don't wish suffering on Cosby. Mm -hmm. And you also write that I would hardly call my experience with Bill Cosby lucky, yet I recognize the luck I had in it. What did you mean by that? Uh, what I meant by that was actually, um, well, there's a couple things, actually. When you survive something, there's other people out there who didn't have the support that I had, would never be able to tell their mothers because their mothers would say, don't ever repeat that and don't bring it up again. So I was lucky to have my mom, to have supporters, uh, other Cosby women, survivors in a community. So, and to survive it, you know, I was given three blue pills. It's a good thing that I woke up that morning. And so the luck is that um, I can sit here today and having been through all that, although it was difficult, I did get justice. Um, 
you know, I've been able to have my healing process. There's other women who are addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol, addicted to sex, and they have a lot of problems. And I'm really, really fortunate. I am lucky. I'm very grateful that you're here to speak to us. Um, what is Hope Healing and Transformation? Hope Healing and Transformation is a foundation that I started. Um, it's, it's a Canadian foundation, and I, I started it because I really felt that I needed to take something, take everything that I had been through and everything that I had learned along the way, and to be able to create something to support other survivors on their healing path. So we started an app, we built an app for survivors where they have free legal assistance, um, emotional support, um, being trauma informed, you know, a library where they can seek materials that they're looking for on their healing path. Um, so this app is an important part of a, our foundation, uh, but uh, it was just taking a negative and turning it into a positive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and helping people along on their healing path. And everybody's healing path looks different. Mm -hmm. One survivor's healing path is much different than another's. But I'm here to say, basically, if I live through it, if I can do it, you can do it too. We look forward to the documentary, which is coming out in the fall. Yes. And we really thank you for um, not only being here, but for writing this book. And for everybody uh, watching, you should Google your mom's uncle, Uncle Slavo. I wanted to talk to you about Uncle Slavo, Slavo. but we didn't have yeah. enough time. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.